James B. Duke was one of the wealthiest industrialists of the 20th century, yet he shunned publicity. He was recognized on two continents as a shrewd businessman and investor, but he rarely gave a public speech. As one reporter wrote in 1922, John D. Rockefeller is as well known in Ocracoke as he is in Wall Street. Henry Ford is sort of a household standby in millions of homes. But this Tar Heel, nobody knows. To his closest acquaintances, however, James B. Duke was warm-hearted and charming, a Southern gentleman to the core. Influenced by a family of generous spirits, he believed in making a difference in the region he called home. Born into a family of dirt-poor farmers in Durham, North Carolina, he rose to unimaginable heights with his strong work ethic, foresight, and keen business sense. He was a common man who did uncommon good, and the signature of James B. Duke ratified his bold idea. His indenture of trust, a 7,200-word living document, is a powerful and thoughtful work that will impact generations for decades to come. His dream to leave a living legacy became a reality, establishing one of the most respected philanthropic organizations in the country, the Duke Endowment. This is his story. He was born to Washington and Artelia Roney Duke in Durham, North Carolina. James, known as Buck, had two older half-brothers, Sidney and Brody, an older sister, Mary, and another older brother, Benjamin. The year was 1856, and there was nothing easy about living in the rural South. That difficult beginning shaped Buck forever. The hardships of the times proved fatal for the Duke family. In 1858, Artelia died from typhoid fever, leaving the widower Washington to care for his children. Sidney had died from the same disease just 10 days earlier. Growing up motherless, young Buck knew firsthand about going without and how hard work made the difference between living and dying. The Civil War ravaged the country. In 1863, the Confederacy, desperate for more soldiers, began drafting men up to 45 years of age. Washington Duke, farmer, father, and in his 40s, had no alternative and was unwillingly conscripted into the Confederacy. He left his small children in the care of relatives and joined the Navy. Eventually captured by Yankee forces, he was imprisoned. When the war finally ended, Washington Duke walked 130 miles back to his beloved homestead. Reunited, the family discovered that years of neglect had taken its toll on their farm. There was little to show for a lifetime of hard work other than a storehouse of dried tobacco. Undeterred, Washington, with the help of his children, started their lives over again. Their farm would yield a crop of prosperity called tobacco. We beat the tobacco up with sticks when it was dry, and then ran it through a fine wire sieve. With the help of my boys, we could put up 400 to 500 pounds per day. From early light, Benjamin, Mary, and Buck hand-packed tobacco in cloth bags that Mary had sewn. They sold their product from the back of a broken-down wagon pulled by mules. They literally built the business from the ground up. As the family company grew, Washington started traveling farther from home. He crisscrossed the country by rail and promoted the Duke brand, while the sons remained in Durham managing the factory. Together, the Dukes built what became nothing less than a dynasty. Buck Duke had a passion for hard work and a sharp business sense. His day often began in the early light and stretched well into dark. I hated to close my desk at night and was eager to get back at it early next morning. 
I needed no vacation or time off. There ain't a thrill in the world to compare with building a business and watching it grow before your eyes. Indeed, the business did grow before his eyes, and Buck Duke saw the opportunities that new inventions like the Bonsack cigarette-making machine could bring to his company. W. Duke Sons & Company was the first in the world to shift production from the tedious manufacturing of hand-rolled, hand-labored cigarettes to mechanized mass production. Mass assembly coupled with mass marketing pushed their products into new areas and created more of a demand than ever for Duke's cigarettes. Buck Duke advertised their brands with free samples, coupons, and imagery on posters and billboards. His aggressive marketing and suggestive cigarette pictures did not please his conservative father. The devout Washington Duke found the gimmicky promotion offensive. But the approach worked, and Buck Duke pioneered a new way of advertising to the masses. The brand grew, the business grew, and customers learned to ask for their products by name. The visionary Dukes opened a factory in New York City and then set their sights on taking their product global. First, the ever-enterprising Buck expanded the company's interests into England. Through mergers of the world's five leading cigarette producers, Duke's American Tobacco Company would become the largest tobacco company ever. With great foresight, the Dukes diversified. Long before an antitrust decision dismantled the American Tobacco Company in 1911, the family had started shifting their interests into new and lucrative industries. They invested in banking, textiles, railways, and hydroelectric power. James B. Duke saw abundant natural resources and unlimited opportunity all around. The power of rushing water especially fascinated him. At his sprawling farm in New Jersey, workers excavated nine lakes and installed 35 fountains. At his home in Charlotte, a fountain sprayed water so high visitors would park nearby to watch the show. The early 1900s were eventful years for James B. Duke. He married Nanalyn Holt Inman, and in 1912, at the seasoned age of 55, he became a father when his only child, Doris, was born. James B. Duke was a devoted husband and father. You certainly are the dearest little girl that any daddy ever had, he wrote to Doris in the summer of 1923. Your affection and devotion to me is the brightest spot in my life. At the turn of the century, during the Great Industrial Age, he pushed his business into new growth areas, stretching his imagination as he envisioned the next venture. He began acquiring land and water rights along the Catawba River. He and his brother Benjamin saw the future in the new industry that fascinated him, hydroelectric power. Within two decades, the company was supplying electricity to more than 300 cotton mills creating jobs and opportunities across the Carolinas. Partnering with Dr. Gil Wiley and William States Lee, James B. Duke founded the Southern Power Company, now known as Duke Energy, one of the leading energy companies in the country. As his wealth increased, Duke began dreaming of a way to channel his fortune into life-enriching services for people in the Carolinas. That obligation to help others had been passed down from his father. A strong faith guided Washington Duke's philanthropy. My old daddy always said that if he amounted to anything in life, it was due to the Methodist circuit riders. If I amount to anything in this world, I owe it to my daddy and the Methodist church. The family's early poverty was never forgotten. Humility was never lost. Be industrious. Do not always be looking for an easy, soft place, Washington Duke said. I have made more furrows in God's earth than any man of 40 years of age in North Carolina. A plan for carrying on his family's philanthropy, of doing big things for God and humanity, preoccupied James B. Duke for years. 
His confidant and attorney, William R. Perkins, described how his client's idea took shape. For over 10 years, there lay in the drawer of my desk a draft of the document which eventually embodied the Duke Endowment. I shall never forget the delight with which Mr. Duke, in the utmost confidence, unfolded the idea to me. He felt it met the test of real assistance. In early December 1924, James B. Duke gathered together his wife, Nanolyn, his daughter, Doris, and several trusted advisors at his home in Charlotte to finish work on an indenture of trust. The group met for four days, discussing the document word for word. On December 8th, newspaper reporters met at the mansion to hear the announcement. One reporter wrote, when William R. Perkins read the document setting forth the outline of Mr. Duke's magnificent proposition, a hushed silence fell upon those present as the magnitude of the gifts began to dawn upon them. The indenture, established with an initial gift of 40 million, captured Mr. Duke's grand vision. Four schools would benefit from his philanthropy. Davidson College and Johnson C. Smith University in North Carolina were named in the indenture, along with Furman University in South Carolina. In addition, 32% of the endowment's annual income would go to Duke University, which was known then as Trinity College. The Duke family had close ties to Trinity. Washington Duke, in the late 1800s, established an endowment for the school with a requirement that women be admitted. Plans for a university, organized around Trinity College, had been brewing for years. William P. Few, president from 1910 to 1940, shared his hopes with James B. Duke. And with the indenture of trust, Few's dream finally had the backing it needed. The indenture of trust also set aside resources to help improve access to quality health care. It provided for organizations that help vulnerable children, and it supported rural United Methodist churches and their leaders. The geographic boundaries of the indenture were confined to North Carolina and South Carolina. Without his generous support, many people believe the two states would be very different today. Just 10 months after signing the indenture, James B. Duke, whose health had been failing for months, died from a blood illness that would have been easily cured today at the medical school that bears his name. Upon his death, he left an additional $67 million to the endowment. His legacy of hope would begin. I wish that I had known Mr. Duke because he he is obviously a remarkable person, and uh, his vision was so great, and his understanding of the needs of people was so great, because he had this great love for the human family, regardless of what it was, whether rich or poor, or black or white, or what have you. And uh, I think that, that's the discernment, that's the insight, that's the, the, the capacity of him to, to embrace everyone that makes his work so valuable. From the North Carolina mountains to the South Carolina coast, Mr. Duke's extraordinary legacy endures today, visible in every life touched in every institution advanced, in every innovation discovered. Were uh, Uncle Buck to come back today and talk to us, I know he would exclaim in wonderment and joy and deep gratitude of what the endowment would be, how it's been handled and how it's grown. I know he wanted it to grow like this. That was his aim, his goal, mission. But I wonder if he ever dreamed it would be this successful. Every man owes something to the state he was born in. And this is what I want to leave.